afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's um, webinar. So this is the Building Safety Act webinar for contractors, and I'm Jennifer Patel from Seek Yorkshire and Humber. Um, we're very grateful to Neve Batterton and Louise Mansfield from Bevan Britain, who are going to be delivering today's session. Now, the session itself will last about 90 minutes. It might not take the full 90, um, but it is booked out until two o'clock. Um, just so you're aware, I will email a copy of the slides over after today's session. Um, it will be recorded and I'll upload the recording onto our YouTube channel and send the link over as well. Uh, and if anybody does require a certificate for CPD purposes, then if you want to pop me an email after today, uh, I can get that over to you. Um, in terms of questions, um, if you want to use the chat function um, or the Q&A function for any of the questions that you do have, um, then as Louise and Neva are going through the slides, they will try and answer those as they come in. But if there's anything that isn't answered, um, then um, questions, we can go through those at the end. Um, so I think that's it. So without further ado, welcome very much. And I'll hand over to Louise. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us over your lunchtime. As Jennifer's just said, we want you guys to get as much as you can out of this rather than us just talking at you on things you're not interested in. So if you have got questions, please do throw them out. No question is a stupid question. If you're thinking it, other people are probably thinking it. And Neve and I have been talking about this piece of legislation almost daily for a long time. So we may say things that make sense to us and not to you. So please just do throw out questions as we go along. I'm hoping Neve will shout at me if you can't see the slides. So I'm hoping that you can. These can be distributed around afterwards so you can have copies. Just to introduce ourselves then. So Neve and I are both legal directors at Bevan Britain, which is a law firm. We well, I advise on all kinds of aspects of criminal regulatory law, so health and safety, fire safety and building safety, as well as lots of other things. And Neve helps people with construction contracts and things on the kind of construction side of things. So I'll start by giving you some background about the Building Safety Act and then Neve will come in with some more practical tips about how this is all implemented in practice in your day to day lives. Of course, we will have a variety of people on the call with quite a few of you. Some of you will know more about building safety than others. So if some of this is too basic, we apologise. And if we're at too high a level to start with, please do throw it in the chat and we can explain things in more detail. So if we move on to the next slide, this is what we want to cover today. The title when the invite came out was what you need to know and what you need to do. So I'm going to talk about what the Building Safety Act is and what has changed, what it applies to and some of the transitional projects and the requirements for higher risk buildings. So the Building Safety Act isn't just about higher risk buildings, but a lot of the key provisions people are interested in are the higher risk building provisions. Then Neve will talk to you about the requirements for all building work for the Part 2A duty holders and requiring that they're competent and for appointing the principal designer principal contractor, contractors and designers. And as it said, please do throw out questions. OK, so what is the Building Safety Act and what has changed? This is a picture lots of you will have seen and the Grenfell Tower Phase 2 Inquiry Report was published recently. If you haven't seen that yet, it's available on the internet free of charge, just Google it. It's about 1500 pages, so you might not want to read all of it, but there is a summary. And I actually find it quite useful to almost just search for a keyword in case you're interested in certain things just to see what's on there. But as I'm sure you've all read about in the press, the problems at Grenfell were a cultural issue within the construction industry of many mistakes being made. And those mistakes being made by many different people over many different years. So the Building Safety Act has been implemented along with lots of secondary legislation. And if anybody's tried to find anything out, you'll find you have to look at about 15 pieces of legislation to find out any answer, as well as multiple pieces of guidance. But the purpose of that act is to stop this happening again. There are some key principles running throughout the Building Safety Act. So an increased understanding of how buildings are constructed and how risk and control measures are managed. It's perhaps quite shocking that lots of clients I have, they don't actually know how their buildings are constructed. And that applies to buildings that are quite old. So obviously people that were involved when it was constructed are no longer around, but also newer buildings. Mm 
And actually, when they start doing intrusive surveys, they find all kinds of things they didn't know, you know, holes in fire compartmentation, missing bits of compartmentation, you know, all sorts of stuff. Is personal obligations and accountability for different people involved in building work. Those people must be competent and there's an aim to change the culture so that instead of everybody shirking responsibility, everybody's taking responsibility. There are some provisions to protect the residents and leaseholders, but we're not going to talk about those today. There's the new building safety regulator. I'm sure you've all heard about the building safety regulator, part of the health and safety executive in charge of all buildings and making sure all buildings are safe, but with a particular focus on the higher risk buildings. The focus of the Building Safety Act is on two things, structural safety and external fire spread. So it is limited in its scope in terms of what it's looking at. The Building Safety Act doesn't change any of the functional requirements under the building regulations. There have been a, a few minor changes. So a ban on combustible materials over buildings of a certain height on the external wall. But as a whole, the technical requirements that all buildings have to be compliant with have not changed. But the key is making sure all buildings are safe. We're going to focus on two things here. So all buildings, the requirement for all buildings doesn't matter how high they are or what they're used for. And those are requirements that have come in place during the construction stages or during any building work. And I'll come back later to talk about what building work is. But then also the requirements for higher risk buildings being those that are at or above 18 metres or seven storeys. And there's requirements there during the construction stages, but then also during the occupation stages. And whilst those of you on the call are, I imagine, much more likely to be involved in the construction stage, I think it's worth you having an understanding of the duties of other people during the occupation stage, because that will help you understand why they need certain bits of information and things from you. So what is building work? We'll come on to that in a moment. But the requirements for all buildings, just building on the slide before, requirements for duty holders and duty holders that are competent that Neve will talk about, that's under part 2A of the building regs, applies to all building work unless it's minor work, which is defined in one of the schedules. The new requirements for higher risk buildings are that you have to get your building control approval from the building safety regulator. You have to go through a new gateway process to take that. And gateway one, which again, we'll speak about in a bit more detail later, is a hard stop. So essentially, until the building safety regulator approves your designs or a client's designs, no building work can take place. There's a requirement for a golden thread of information, which take, is taken through into the occupation stage, which is why I said it's important to understand what that involves. And it costs more. It costs more and it takes longer. So the gateway to application for approval of design to the building safety regulator should take either eight or 12 weeks, depending on if it's worked to an existing or a new building. But lots of clients are telling me at the moment it's taking more like six months. And lots of clients are having their applications rejected because the applications don't contain the detail they should be containing. So all of this is leading to more time, more cost, more delay. As I just mentioned, anything that's building work has to meet the functional requirements set out in the building regulations, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and it will need building control sign off. There, the current requirements under the regulations under schedule one there is a new section coming in i think relatively soon but that's what there is currently at the moment and none of that has changed bar as i mentioned earlier the addition to regulation seven of the building regs which is a ban on combustible materials on the outer walls of certain buildings of a certain height so that's kind of a whistle top tour at a high level what the Building Regulation Safety Act and the regulations are all about. But what does it actually apply to? And I think this question sometimes gets forgotten, not when you're constructing a new large building, because obviously that is building work. But if you're doing something that's less than that, the first question I say to all our clients is, is it actually building work at all? Building work is defined in Reg 3. You'll probably be familiar with this, but it's building a new building or building an extension. That's pretty obvious. 
altering buildings or changing what they're used for. So if you go from non-residential to residential, for example, it's the four bullet points at the end of the slide, I think, are causing much more confusion amongst the industry. So if you're installing or replacing a controlled service or a controlled fitting, again, that's defined, but not necessarily if you're repairing it. And one of the issues I think at the moment, which is completely unclear, is whether internal doors count as a controlled fitting. And as part of that, whether internal fire doors are treated any differently. And speaking to different building control professionals, some say they are building work and you need approval. Some say they aren't building work and you don't need approval. Some says it depends whether part L of the regulations apply, which is all about thermal efficiency. That is about as clear as mud to me. And so my explanation is probably as clear as mud to you. But I think that puts us in a position where lots of people don't know if they need building regulations to change a fire door. Now, there is another bit in the definition of building work which talks about a material alteration. So essentially, if you make a building or a controlled service or fitting worse or less compliant than it was before, that brings it into being building work. Now, I can't imagine most people would intentionally make things worse, but you do have to consider not knock on effects. So you might put something in, but actually that then makes something else less compliant. So I think this definition, it needs going back to regularly because it is unclear, but it's the first thing I think people should look at because if what you're doing isn't building work, you don't need building regulations approval from anybody. There's also a provision for emergency works, but actually the phrase is emergency repairs, and this is only for higher risk buildings. But if you're doing something that is an emergency repair, you can start the work, give notice to the building safety regulator, then put your application in afterwards. But this is defined very, very narrowly. And an emergency repair is essentially like a situation where this ceiling is about to collapse on my head any minute and I might die. It's not if we don't fix this in six months, there's going to be a problem. So unless you have to do it urgently, i.e. now, and you're on the phone trying to get people down in a rush, it's probably not going to be an emergency repair. What is a higher risk building then? I've mentioned those. Some of you, of course, will be more than familiar with this. Some of you might not. But for the purpose of part three of the Building Safety Act, which is about design and construction, a higher risk building is one that is at least 18 metres high or has at least seven storeys. So essentially 18 metres plus and seven storeys plus and contains either two residential units or more or is a hospital or is a care home. Two residential units, a residential unit is defined in the legislation. It's essentially somewhere somebody calls home as well as student accommodation. Hospital is also quite strictly defined in the legislation. So if you're doing any work on hospitals, do just check what that is, because a hospital is not necessarily what you think a hospital might be. It doesn't include outpatients, for example. It has to have wards in it. But one of the parts of this that a lot of clients struggle with is defining the extent of a building. So if you have lots of buildings that are linked together or different parts of buildings that are linked together, you might be able to split them into what we call independent sections. The test for this is in the second box, so the first white box on your screen. It depends if a section or an area has its own entrance and exit to the outside and then either has no other access to any part of the wider building or only has access to other parts that don't have residential units. The second point there of not being connected to anything with residential units is particularly. Oh, apologies, I'll move that. Thanks for pointing that out. I've just moved that. Hopefully it's going to have three screens and you're on one and the slides are on another one. The key on not being connected to anything with a residential unit is useful for hospitals. But if you're working on residential buildings, the key is probably you don't have any access to any other parts. So, for example, if there's some guidance, government guidance on this. If you have a gym on the first floor or a restaurant or a cafe or a shop, with a tall residential tower block above it, so long as the shop, gym, whatever it is, has its own entrance and exit to the outside. And to get into the residential bit, you kind of have to go outside, then back in another door, so it doesn't have direct access. 
then you can consider that shop, gym, whatever it is, as a separate independent section. Then when you measure the number of stories and height of it, you can discount everything above it and you just essentially just have a one story building. So any work, building work you did in that gym or shop, whatever it is, wouldn't be to a higher risk building. So you'd still need approval, but you could go to your local authority or through what was known as an independent inspector. Sorry, an approved inspector. If you're doing work in the residential building above, you'd still have to go to the HRB because that would be measured differently. This is quite complicated, but I think if you have buildings where you have multiple parts connected, it's worth looking at the government guidance on the internet. That doesn't apply to new buildings. If you're building something new and it's above 18 metres, you can't split it into separate parts, even if, for example, you're doing three tower blocks connected to each other. And if you're building something new that says two storeys, but it directly connects into a, a taller building above 18 metres, then that would also have to be considered as part of that higher risk building it's connected to. So none of that is simple. It's been six months of me trying to get my head around that, especially for those in, working on hospitals. But be aware, I'd say, that it's there and it might be worth looking at in certain situations. OK, I mentioned use before. I won't go through this because I don't want to run out of time today, but there's the definition of residential unit and hospital. If you want to refer to it, the slides will be sent round afterwards. And there is some specific guidance on how you measure height. And again, in borderline cases, I definitely say to check this. So, for example, I spoke to a client earlier today where they thought their building was a high risk building, but actually all there was on the top floor was a plant room. And you don't count plant rooms when you're counting stories and height, for example. You also don't count anything completely below ground level. And where a building's not on flat ground, this guidance on which bit of the building you count as the ground floor level. So again, it's the same government guidance. At the end of this, I'll put the guidance link in the chat so you can all find it. That's definitely worth consulting any time you have one that's borderline around about 18 metres, seven storeys or just above. OK, so let's talk about the requirements for higher risk buildings in particular. And then I'll hand over to Neve to talk about the requirements for all buildings withstanding their height. So this little flow chart is, I think, the thought process that people need to go through. Is it building work at all, which is what I spoke about before? Then is it a higher risk building? If it is a higher risk building, you need your building control approval from the building safety regulator. If you don't, local authority building control or an approved inspector. That's essentially the key change here. If you do have to go to the building safety regulator, like I mentioned before, there is a three stage gateway process. This is, doesn't change the functional requirements, like I mentioned before, that your building has to meet, but it changes the amount of scrutiny that has and who it is scrutinised by. Hospitals, gateway one doesn't apply to those, so just bear in mind if you're doing any work on a hospital. But gateway one is basically about planning, so when you apply for planning consent or when your client applies for planning consent, the building safety regulator is consulted and you have to, they have to consider things that relate to building safety at that stage. So it's important to be evidence in it that you're thinking about it, even at planning. Gateway two then is when you essentially submit your application for building control approval. And that's approval of the designs and there is guidance and legislation which explains exactly what you have to put in that gateway to approval. And if it's not all in there, it will be rejected. It replaces, like it says, the deposit of plans stage here. But as I said again before, it's a hard stop. So you have to put your application in. Then you will sit in a virtual queue for what could be a number of months, perhaps up to six months. Then you will get contact from the BSR, who are then going to allocate your case to somebody to review it. So that takes time. The key here is getting applications in early because then you get in the queue earlier. So if you want to start building something next summer, your application really needs to be going in ASAP from now. And making sure that application contains everything it needs to contain because 
the BSR, if they're not happy with what they get, are that just rejecting applications and then you have to go back to the beginning of the queue. And that obviously causes issues in relation to breach of contract, for example, and things like that that Neve will be able to pick up on later. Then at the end of construction, we've got gateway three. So the client will essentially tell the building safety regulator they've finished. The building safety regulator will check if everything's been built in accordance with the designs they approved at gateway two. If they do, they will give you a completion certificate. You can't occupy a building or an area of a building if it's residential until that completion certificate has been received because you have to register that building with the building safety regulator before it can be occupied. But if you're doing minor works, for example, to a building where residents aren't being moved out, that doesn't apply. They don't have to be moved out just until you get your completion certificate. So that is the gateway regime. There's a lot of information required and it's a longer, more difficult process, I think is the summary of that. This slide here just talk about, talks about the potential programme impacts, which I mentioned before. So gateway to 12 weeks if it's a new building, eight weeks if it's worked to an existing. The BSR have the ability to ask you to agree to an extension. And essentially you have to agree because if you don't, your application will just be rejected. So those, I don't think the BSR are meeting those deadlines in most cases at the moment. There is a procedure for major changes. So if you change anything from your gateway to approval onwards, sometimes you just have to note that in a change control log. That's one of the documents you have to submit gateway to. Sometimes you have to notify the BSR, but you can carry on. But if it's what they call a major change, then you have to tell them and then you can't do anything that relates to that major change until you've had the approval, which can take another eight weeks. And gateway three, again, is meant to take up to eight weeks. There is an option to apply in stages and request partial completion certificates. So look at that if that's relevant. But some of my key suggestions here are, as I said, submit in advance and submit as good applications as you can. Try and avoid any major changes because then you haven't got that delay to factor in. And have discussions if you can get hold of anybody is the caveat for that with the BSR in advance and talk to them about it. For buildings that are borderline and you're not sure if they're a HRB or not, some clients are finding it more useful to speak to their local authority building controls if they have a good relationship with them because they get an answer back slightly quicker. OK, there's some information that's additional that has to be provided now. These are just a couple of the key ones. So fire safety information is now required. It has to be sent to the responsible person, so the person responsible for managing fire safety after construction. And there's also requirements for compliance declarations. So Neve will speak in a bit about uh, principal contractors and principal designers. But if you are in either of those roles, you will be required to sign something to confirm that everything you have done complies with your duties under the new Part 2A of the building regulations. This is a bit more information on this slide, just about staged work and partial completion certificates. Look at it if you think it might be of use to any projects. And then I mentioned the golden thread before. It's detailed in another set of regulations, which is listed at the bottom of the slide. But there's a duty on the client during design and construction to make sure a golden thread of information is collated. And the aim of that is to make sure we don't end up in the future in the position we're in now, where lots of people don't have a clue how their buildings are being constructed. If you're not a client, then you haven't got the duty to collate that, but you will be being asked to feed into that if you're involved in any of the design or construction, because the information you produce will be needed. And the idea is that it's all going to be stored electronically. And in 50 years from now, if anybody wants to know what work happened in 2025, they'll be able to check the golden thread to find those records. And it's essentially all the records that confirm that building is compliant with the building regulations as they stand at the date of the works. OK, you may have heard of mandatory occurrence reporting. So this is a requirement under the legislation during design and construction and during occupation. It essentially means if anything happens that either causes fire or the spread of fire 
or structural collapse or that has the potential to cause either of those issues, they have to be reported to the building safety regulator. Again, we're talking about higher risk buildings only here. Even if you've immediately been able to resolve the issue, it still has to be reported. So it could include some of the items on the screen, defective building work, fire safety issues that could result in the spread of fire, use of non-compliant products, inappropriate or incorrect installation of construction products or product failure against a specification or claimed performance. You can see a lot of those issues were issues that have been brought up in the grand fault inquiry, which is why they're there. So the BSR have to be notified about those and the BSR have power to investigate and, if necessary, take action. We mentioned some transitional arrangements before. These were slightly more relevant a year ago when everything was coming into force. But essentially, if these tradition, transitional arrangements apply, you don't have to follow everything I've said for high risk buildings in terms of going to the building safety regulator, following the gateways, etc. So they apply if full plans or an initial notice was in place and not rejected before the 1st of October last year, so just over a year ago, and work on the project had then sufficiently progressed before the 6th of April this year, so essentially six months after the 1st of October, give or take a few days. There is a definition of sufficiently progressed, it's on the screen. So if any projects have their plans or original notice before the 1st of October and had complied with this sufficient progression requirement by the 6th of April, then all these new requirements for HRBs won't apply. But for any work that hasn't had full plans or initial notice deposited by the 1st of October last year, this is completely irrelevant anyway. So anything you're planning or doing from now going forward won't be relevant for these transitional provisions. I just want to mention a couple more points about part four before I hand over to Neve. So I mentioned at the start, part four of the Building Safety Act is about the requirement to manage occupied buildings. The duties I don't imagine will land on anyone on this call, although of course I don't know who everybody is. But the duties fall on the accountable persons, so there can be more than one, there might just be one, and the principal accountable person. So essentially, they both have to assess and manage fire and structural safety risks for the parts of the building they're responsible for. Again, this is just high risk buildings again. Anyone can be an accountable person if they own or are responsible for repairing any of the common parts, which could include the external wall, for example, or the staircases or the corridors or the lobbies. And then each building has to have one principal accountable person. So if there's only one accountable person anyway, that person is automatically the principal accountable person. But if there's multiple accountable persons, then the principal accountable person, essentially the, the lead accountable person, is the party that's responsible for the structure and exterior of a higher risk building. So kind of the external wall. These people's duties were to register the building by the 1st of October 2023 if it was occupied at that stage. If not, it has to be registered before occupation. There is a register online, again, if you Google it, you'll find it, of all registered buildings. So if you are working on something that's registered, it's worth, well, if something's a HRB, it's worth checking if it's registered. This only relates, however, to higher risk buildings that meet their stories and height I mentioned, and that have two or more residential units. So hospitals and care homes, don't have to comply with this part four requirement. You have to provide the building safety regulator with key building information. The duty holders do, the principal accountable person will take that on when the registration was made or is made. The accountable person, the principal accountable person have to put together a safety case report for the building, which is electronic and up to date. It has to look at all fire and structural risks and record all reasonable steps that have been taken to in, in fact reduce or eliminate those risks. The building safety regulator is going through a process of marking everybody's homework on that front through what it calls the building assessment certificate process. So it will write to principal accountable persons and say, it's your turn, you need to send us your safety case report and we're gonna have a look at it. If we're happy, we'll give you a building assessment certificate if we won't, you'll have to do some additional work to bring it up to compliance. That process 
they, the building safety regulator says is probably going to take about five years because there's about there's quite a lot of buildings that have been registered. So they're starting with the tallest ones and the, those that have combustible cladding on the outside. So those that they think are the most risky and then working their way down. Duty holders here, the council person and the principal council person also have to engage with residents and so they have to have strategies for that. And they have to have complaints procedures, which also allow residents to complain straight to the building safety regulator. And just a final slide from me on safety case report, because again, some of the information you provide at design and construction stages will be needed by these accountable persons for their safety case report. So it's useful for you to know what a safety case report has to include. So it's got some basic building information, including plans, etc. Needs to know about the building's construction. So fire compartmentation, materials, stability systems, load bearing systems. Needs to know about any refurbishments or other changes or other building work that has happened after it was officially constructed. Needs to know some information about residents, which probably won't come from you guys. Needs to know about all services and utilities. There needs to be a risk assessment summary and then there needs to be a strategy for emergency. So you might find that those managing occupied buildings ask you for some of that information. OK, I'm going to pass over to Neve. Um, thanks very much, Louise. Um, so as Louise has said, um, I am a construction lawyer. Uh, I'm based in the Leeds office. I work with Sarah Wilson, who's heavily involved with CICA, that some of you may know. Um, I work on the transactional side, so most of my involvement with the BSA to date has been um, amending uh, building contracts um, to um, reflect um, the new regulations and also um, placing um, principal designer um, appointments as well. Um, so Louisa has referred to the um, transitional period and um, as she said as well, like it's almost a year now and um, to the day that um, we're dealing with the transitional period. So a lot of them won't become relevant, but I will just mention briefly um, what um, schemes uh, would stay within the old regime. And um, to, to have stayed within the old regime, the client had to give initial notice to the relevant local authority um, or deposit full plans with the relevant local authority before the 1st of October 2023. Um, and if this was done, um, the works um, would should still be covered by the transitional uh, transitional arrangements, provided that neither the initial notice nor the plans had been rejected, um, approval for the work had not lapsed, and um, the initial notice um, that was given um, has not been cancelled. Um, so the new regime applies to um, HRB. Um, and um, but with non HRB, it applies when the new regime to the building work, sorry, the new regime applies to building work uh, where the deposited plans are rejected by the local authority on or after the 1st of October 2023. If no notice of the building work was notified to a building control body before the 1st of October 23, a new building control approval application must be made and the new regime will apply. And if building control was notified um, before the 1st of October, um, but work was not started before the 6th of April 24, um, the new um, duty holder and um, competence regulations would apply to the building works. So just to note that um, if you're under the old regime and there is a stop for any reason um, to the works and they're paused, um, the stop would only become relevant and fall under the new regime if the notice lapsed under a section 32 of the Building um, Act uh, 1984 um, because um, the work had not commenced within three years from the deposit of the plans. So myself and Louise were recently asked this by a client, however, because the works had only stopped for 2.5 years, they were still under the old regime as opposed to the new regime. So obviously with contractor insolvency, that's quite relevant because we do find that there uh, has been some stops to the work. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so um, who are the duty holders under the building safety regulations? Um, section 34 states that these are the client, um, the contractor, principal designer, principal contractor and all designers. So for the purposes of our works, we view that a project manager, employees agent uh, would not be a designer. 
Um, so the, um, who is the client? The client is the person for whom the building work is done um, and uh, their duties are set out under Regulation 11. Um, so they must make the suitable arrangements to plan, manage and monitor a project, uh, provide building information to every designer and contractor on the project. They must check the competence of the entities um, it proposes to appoint on a project, including the principal contractor and the principal designer. They must cooperate and share information with other relevant duty holders and they must appoint in writing the principal contractor and um, the principal uh, designer. Um, so just to note that the client themselves does not have to be competent. However, if they don't appoint a principal contractor and principal designer and they become one, um, then they should ensure that they have the relevant competencies. Um, so the principal contractor, um, the, this is the contractor um, appointed to be in control of the whole of the project during the construction phase. They have the overall responsibility um, for compliance with building regulations and safety. Their specific uh, duties are set out again under Regulation N. They must plan, manage and monitor all the building work, coordinate matters relating to the building work to ensure it complies with building regulations, take all steps to ensure them and their team cooperate, communicate and coordinate their work with the client, principal designer and contractors. Take all steps to ensure building works of all contractors is coordinated so that it complies with the relevant requirements. Take all steps to ensure contractors and other persons involved in building work comply with the duties under the building uh, regulations and liaise with the principal designer to assist, sorry, and assist the client in providing information to other designers. Um, so the duties of the principal designer is set out under Regulation 11, 11M. So the principal designer is the designer appointed to be in control of all of the design work. Their overall responsibility is for ensuring compliance with building regulations and safety during design phase. Um, their specific duties are to coordinate matters in relation to the design work to ensure that all to ensure that the building work um, will comply with building regulations, ensure that they and all designers working on the project cooperate, communicate and coordinate their work with the client, principal contractor and other designers. They must liaise with the principal contractor and share information relevant to the planning, management and monitoring of the work. And they must assist the client in providing information to other designers and contractors. Uh, then we have the contractors and their duties are set out under Regulation um, 11L. Um, so a contractor is any person who, for the furtherance of business, carries out, manages or controls any building work. Their duties are um, to not start work unless the client is aware of its duties, to ensure building work complies with all requirements, provide each worker under their control with supervision, instruction and information so that the building work complies with the requirements and to provide advice to the principal contractor on whether any work is higher risk building work. Um, and finally, we have the designers. So a designer is any person who in the furtherance of business carries out any design work or arranges for or instructs someone under their control to carry out design work. Um, their duties are set out under Regulation 11K and again, they are not to start work unless the client is aware of its duties. They are to take all reasonable steps to ensure that if built, the building work to which the design relates will comply with all relevant requirements. When providing design, um, they must take all reasonable steps to provide sufficient information to the client about design, construction and maintenance of the building. If they're only carrying out part of the project, they must consider other design work that directly relates to the building and report non-compliance. And they must provide advice to the principal designer about whether the work is higher risk building work if requested. Um, next slide. So uh, we mentioned previously um, the competency uh, requirements. Um, so these are set out under section um, 35 um, of the Building Safety Act. 
So each um, prospective duty holder must be competent to carry out um, building or design work. So in practice, um, they have to make declarations around their competency, um, but also it's up to the client um, to check the competencies. Um, so the competency test, what does it look like? Um, any person um, that carries out building work or any design work must have um, the appropriate skills, knowledge, experience and behaviours of an individual. Um, so they must have organi organisational capability to fulfil their roles, including management policies, procedural si procedures, systems and resources. And there is a duty on anyone appointing a third party to take all reasonable steps to ensure um, the competency of those that they um, engage. So next um, dealing, sorry, next slide. Um, so looking at each of these points in turn, uh, what does that mean? Um, so the skills, um, they must have the ability to perform an activity or task consistently um, with a um, specific intended outcome. So for example, preparing specifications, um, establishing um, user requirements, implementing design solutions and um, taking into account critical constraints and ensuring that the application of the design um, results in appropriate practical outcomes. Um, in terms of knowledge, um, there must be an assimilation of facts, theories and practices in relation to a given role, function or activity, such as identifying standards and codes of practice, developing systems and processes, conducting complex under non-standard technical analysis and reviewing specifications and tenders to identify technical issues and potential improvements. Um, for experience, uh, there must be participation in relevant activities or observation of facts and events leading to acquisition and improvement of knowledge and skills. For example, evaluating potential methods of carrying out um, a task and selecting the most appropriate solution recognising a difficulty and then identifying um, uh, the uh, correct approach for resolving it and identifying an improvement in a technique, procedure, process or method. And finally, behaviour. Um, there must be observational things that an individual does or does not do, such as act ethically and contribute to safe outcomes and demonstrate leadership and communication, manage their own um, uh, sorry, manage own and contribute to organisational competency, demonstrate responsibility and understand uh, the duty of care. So um, next slide, please, Louise. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the things that I do daily is we appoint um, principal designers. Um, a question that we come across quite often is, um, you know, what should we do and how do we appoint a principal designer? So um, there's a couple of ways of looking at this. If your consultant is going, your principal designer is going to be a separate consultant. So um, not part of your um, existing team and it's not going to be a contractor, then we would advise that you put a separate consultancy appointment in place. So this would look like a standard form appointment that you would put in place for an architect or um, an engineer. And um, it must be capable of novation um, because at any point they may be novated to the contractor. Um, so the slight difference between um, a principal designer appointment and a bog standard architect's appointment um, is that it must set out what the role is um, and it will specify the legislation that it must comply with. Um, now, if an appointment doesn't specify this, there should still be an obligation in the appointment to comply with the statutory regulations. So that really should cover it. But we do like to specifically specify the BSA in the same way that we specifically specify um, CDM. And there must be a competency warranty in there so that they warrant their competency. Um, and they must also um, extend this competency to their employees. So confirmation that their employees or their sub consultants are also going to have the um, relevant competency. And um, there must be a written records of steps of its appointment um, of its employees um, if it's going to be required to do so. 
it must have um, uh, an obligation there that it will do so. Um, and then um, where the contractor um, is the principal designer, um, they can be appointed in two ways. So they could be appointed via a separate appointment um, or it could just be uh, written into the contract. Um, I've done it both ways. Um, so some contractors have just requested that we complete the relevant article um, in the um, JCT contract. I'm talking about JCT, but the same will apply to NEC with different terminology. Um, and some uh, contractors have said, here's an appointment. Um, we would like the uh, employer to specifically appoint us under an appointment for our principal designer duties for the BSA. And um, so if it was an appointment and um, the same rules would apply to what I've just explained. Um, and if it's the contract, um, you would need to ensure that the um, services that they're going to carry out as BSA principal designer are clearly set out in the scope of the specification to the um, contract. And then you would wrap it up in the building contract. So if we're looking at um, a JCT design and build, for example, uh, we are currently working with two versions, um, 2016 and 2024. So if it's 2016, um, we would normally amend this uh, to insert the duty holder requirements because it's not automatically in there. Um, we do this um, by amending the JCT articles um, and we would then um, amend clause 3.16 to include the BSA uh, or duty holder regulations um, in with the CDM regulations. And that means that we would therefore have updated our JCT 2016 and then we can amend it as we go along or complete it as we go along to include that the contractor is the principal designer. Uh, with JCT 2024, um, I'm sure that most people are aware of this now. Um, if it's a non HRB, um, the new contract incorporates the duty holder regulations. So it's incorporated a new Article 6 and a new Article 7 to cover um, the duty holder regulations. So you would insert in there if your contractor is the BSA principal designer and or if they are the BSA principal contractor. The clause 3.16 has automatically been amended um, so that the CDM regs also um, will not incorporate but include um, the BSA regulations clause. And then you could put add in um, an additional competency statement if you wanted. Um, so in some of our amendments, we've put in an additional competency statement um, in clause three or section three. And we've also added um, a declaration that the contractor um, doesn't have any sanctions um, at the moment. And if it does incur any sanctions, it would um, notify the employer in due course. Um, and then looking at the next slide, please. Appointing a principal contractor. Um, so this is simply done under the um, building contract where the contractor under the building contract is also the principal contractor. So again, um, as I mentioned above, if you were um, using a JCT 24, you would complete your Article 6 and 7. If you were using the JCT 2016, I would advise that it's amended and that you can incorporate who the principal contractor is within your articles. You then need to cover the duties that they've got to carry out um, under the um, scope or the specification to the building contract. Um, again, the principal contractor must have the relevant competency requirements. And again, um, in clause 3.16, I would have a competency statement where the contractor states that where they are the building sorry, well, they are the principal contractor for BSA. They have the competency and that they don't have any sanctions. And should they incur any sanctions that they would notify the employer during the project. And, and that covers uh, my area. If you have any questions, please do ask. I can see one is popping up. And I will also let Louise just sum up as I'm reading the question because it looks like quite a long one. So go for it, Louise. <laughs> 
Brilliant. OK, we've got plenty of time for questions, so please do throw any in that you have. As I said, nothing is a silly question. But just to sum up a lot of what we've said here, I, I think these are kind of the main themes running through the Building Safety Act. And if you add the four on the outside, you should, in theory, get the middle safe buildings option. So the information and evidence about the building and how it's compliant with the building regulations, which essentially should mean how it's safe, which is also called the golden thread, but actually it's just about information and evidence, competency and accountability of everybody involved in building work and a shift in the culture so everybody's taking responsibility. And Neve mentioned one of the requirements for competency is behaviour, which is a bit hard to measure really, but what it essentially is saying is that if you see anybody on a project that doesn't seem to be taking safety seriously or seems to be cutting corners, seems to be wanting to put materials onto buildings that aren't compliant, et cetera, then you should be speaking out and speaking up. That is the kind of built behaviours that are now expected from everybody involved in building works. We talk a lot, today's been about building safety, but actually when you're managing the safety of building, it's not just about the Building Safety Act. Parties will also have duties under the fire safety order, there's things like damp and mould to be thinking about, general health and safety requirements to think about. So do think about it holistically because you only want to be building something once. And I think the, the, the best slide for thinking about what is right and what is wrong is this. Can you justify your decisions made if you were involved in what turns out to be the next Grenfell? Hopefully there won't be one, but if there is, would you be comfortable sitting in the dark justifying the decisions you made and I should make a caveat this is a random picture of a random man off the internet he may or may not have ever been inside a courtroom but think about yourselves there and you will have to make some tough decisions sometimes and you know cost is always a factor time is always a factor availability is always a factor but can you justify if you ever had to the decisions you made and if you can't they're not the right decision OK, Neve, have you had a chance? We've only still got one question. If that's one for you, have you had a chance to have a look? Um, yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, so Paul's just said, uh, you know, pointed out that often a contractor has to appoint at the BSA PD um, to be the competent person. Um, and um, is there a disconnect here regarding the um, competency requirements on a designer under the BSA and those on a contractor regarding strict liability? Um, so I don't think there is a disconnect. I think that the competency requirements um, will remain the same um, for whether the um, principal designer has been appointed by the client or whether they've been appointed by the um, contractor. Um, so I think that the um, competency requirements the whole way through um, will be the same for the uh, contractor and for the principal designer. Um, Sorry, that's my reading of it. If I've misinterpreted that, just let me know or, or chip in if you want to get involved in a conversation on Nepal. And um, obviously you don't have to just put your questions in if anybody does want to speak. Um, can they do that, um, Jennifer? Can they? I'll test it. Can we? Can I raise my hand? Yeah, I certainly can. So it works for me. But anybody else? Yeah, please do. Just adding on to that, Neve, I, th I think it's an interesting one and I've had lots of cases and projects where people have said no one will take on the building regulations PD role. Yeah. If you're the contractor, if you're under a design and build type contract, then perhaps you should be taking on the PD role. If you're not involved in the design, then you shouldn't be taking on that role. But actually, all the PD has to do is make sure that the design complies with the building regulations. Well, the design, that's not new. The design should always have complied with the building regulations. All you're required to do now is confirm that it does. But what I'm saying to those acting as clients is that if you're using a designer who is essentially in charge of all the sub designers and they won't take on the role, then that is a little bit of a red flag for me because all they're essentially saying is we can't confirm our design complies with the building regs. Well, what on earth have you appointed them for if their design, they're not able to confirm their design complies with the building regs? because you're never going to get through gateway two. Now, some of the issue might be insurance. So I can see that as being a project. But as a client, you, you need to know that your designers 
are competent, hence the competency requirement, to make sure that all their designs, and if you are coordinating everybody else, to make sure when it all comes together, it's going to comply with the building regs because you're going to you'll want that as a client, a compliant building. You'll need that to get through gateway two. If it's not a higher risk building, you'll still need that to get through building control approval. And ultimately, everybody wants a building that's compliant and safe at the end of the day. So that is a bit of in relation to me. So I've just seen I've just seen Paul put another message on. Paul, it's Jen. I've allowed your mic if you do, um, if you would prefer to um, discuss things verbally. No, so I can see it. He said. The, OK, he... yeah, thanks. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's just Hi, we've got this we've got this issue. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 It's just we've got this issue bubbling away at the moment. And um, when you look when you go on Reba's um website, Reba are advising all the architects that if they're working for a DMB contractor where the DMB contract has been appointed as as BSA PD, that they that the they will only act as a, a BSA advisor for the contract for the contractor. And therefore, I, there appears to me to be a disconnect between the liability on the contractors as BSA PD when we're not designers and the, and the liability on the advisor who's not taking on the role as BSA PD. But presumably, these architects are doing design work, right? So they will therefore, even if they're not the principal designer, they will be a designer under the regulations, you can't yes, just but call... under, under under the regulations as I read them, the designers have a reasonably practicable type of liability, and the contractor has a strict liability. So there's a gap there, isn't there? Y yeah, there is. But I suppose as a PD, you're all if you're subcontracting out designs to other people, that's presumably because you aren't able to do them yourselves but if you're taking on the pd role or whoever is taking on the pd role has to be competent to take out that role so it has to be competent to look at other designs and make sure they get enough information from those parties to confirm it's compliant yes so yeah, yes but a, a contractor essentially some contractors might have those skills in-house but most contractors would have to outsource these those skills to to a, a, an architect or other designer who's been trained in building regs um, and then for that architect or other designer trained in building regs to only work to a reasonable standard of, of competency and us to work to a strict liability seems that it, um, it's um, yeah I always envisage that uh, that Hackett had intended that they could pin the tail on the donkey and that the PD would be a, a direct appointment by the client not a transfer of responsibility to a contractor. No, it absolutely shouldn't be. I suppose if you are a D&B contractor, though, by virtue of accepting that appointment, you're accepting that you're competent to manage design, are you not? Yeah, and I, and I would expect to be able to then transfer that liability and my PI insurance, well, no doubt, would expect me as well to transfer that liability to an architect who's accepting that liability or a, or a designer that's working for me accepting that liability. It appears as though the advice by Reba is is don't accept that liability and leave this little gap between advisor and and um, and somebody who's got the liability. Yeah, well, I think if you can't find anybody to pass that liability down to, you need to reconsider whether you're competent to accept that liability yourself. Yeah, in which case, more, we're seeing most design and build projects come out to contractors now with that caveat to be BSAPD. So does that preclude most contractors from doing design build? If they're not competent to do so, I suppose, yeah, it does. In, in which case, most contractors aren't because they don't do the design. They, we, our RPI is underpinned by the designers we employ who take on the liability and have carried their own PI. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I it's see, a muddle. I, yeah, I can see your difficulty, Paul. Well, it's not my difficulty, it's the industry's difficulty. Yeah, yeah. Because that's how the industry works. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not saying something that's different here. This no, no, is no. how contractors work. Yeah, same to everybody, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I'm not that's, sure. That's just have... my point. Thank you. No, it's a really good point, and I'm not sure we have a solution um, when Reba are advising people not to take that on. Any other... Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Any other yeah. questions from anyone? We've got plenty of time. I can't see anything at the moment. If I just move on to the, well, the last slide, it's just a holding slide, but it's 
got mine and Neve's details on it. So if anybody wants to contact us and speak to us afterwards, you're more than welcome to, or you can feed back questions through Jennifer. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I'd say that um, if there is any questions, like Louise has just said, if you want to direct them my way and then um, I can get an answer and I could maybe email those out to, to everybody because uh, it might be that if somebody's thinking it, then so is somebody else. Um, but thank you so much, Louise and Neve. Uh, a really informative session, which I'm sure has helped shed some clarity um, on a very complex um, topic. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, if anybody would like a certificate for CPD purposes, pop me an email and um, I'll send the slides over and the recording. Uh, I'll upload that to YouTube. Um, I might cut that bit out, Paul, where you start speaking. I don't know whether you want your voice on YouTube. So uh, yeah, we'll do that. But thank you so much. Um, and yeah, cheers. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.